Welcome to the Chawton House Garden Festival. I'm Bex, owner of Botanical Trails. I'm a floral artist specialising in working with um, everlasting flowers, so flowers that have been dried and preserved for future use. I'm going to share with you today a little bit about um, my book, which has just launched, so it's called Everlastings, no surprise there. Um, uh, how to grow, harvest and create with dried flowers. I am going to read a short um, paragraph from my book and then I'm going to give you a few tips on how you can incorporate dried flowers into your garden um, and how you can get started with drying them yourselves. Um, now is the perfect time to do that. Summer has just around the corner, feels like it's already arrived, but officially just around the corner. Um, and many of those sort of blousy spring blooms are coming to an end and we're seeing already seed heads and things like that pop up in the hedgerows, so plenty of opportunity to dry material for us to use in the autumn. So yeah, as I said, my book Everlastings is out, um, well, it came out a couple of weeks ago <laughs> and is available to buy through Chawton House's website. Um, and I'll begin by just reading a short paragraph about why um, I, I love dried flowers as much as I do. I believe something magical happens to flowers when they're dried. Their vibrancy is dulled slightly, but their beauty is magnified. This beauty draws you in to intimately inspect a crinkle or on a petal or a colour gradient you may not have noticed before. They have an understated beauty that rivals their blousy, extroverted former selves. They encourage you to slow down and observe their intricacies, one of the many reasons I enjoy working with them. So, my journey with dried flowers started four or five years ago when I um, rediscovered them because both my mum and my grandma uh, were avid kind of lovers of dried flowers. Um, and what I love the most about them is their versatility, uh, their sustainability as well. So the fact that they last longer than you know a week or two if you're working with fresh flowers. Um, and the fact that they enable you to capture a memory of your own from earlier in the year. Um, so, you know, heady days of summer, captured through dried flowers of that time and then made into a wreath or something like that. Really kind of, um, yeah, I really like that side of it. And I now grow um, most of my flowers that I use um, and dry in my small town garden and on my allotment. And it's really, really easy to get started. And I have no doubt that if those of you with a garden or with access to outdoor space, if you were to go out after this, uh, session and have a look around you'll be able to find things that are either already dried by nature you know herself or um, enable you to kind of bring them in and dry them for your own use so a few things that I look out for when I'm looking for materials to dry you've obviously got your flowers and I have plenty dry behind me these are predominantly um, spring flowers so I've got tulips ranunculus and peonies um, so there's the flowers, but then there's also the grasses and the seed heads and the branches. Um, and I've got some examples actually in front of me here today. I went for a little walk with my boys earlier um, and already found an abundance of things out there to dry. So I have some fever few here, which dries beautifully. Um, and for this, I would just hang them upside down on my branch, uh, maybe for kind of two to three weeks, something like that. I'll touch more on how to dry them a bit later. Um, I have something here which is wonderful when you look up close to it. It's, um, it's a wildflower called um, Shepherd's Purse. And uh, it's quite tricky to see, because I'm filming this myself, but um. But if you look at the individual seed heads, they're shaped like teeny tiny hearts and they're just absolutely stunning and I love the kind of flow that they have. And then I've also found in the hedgerows um, some cow parsley seed heads. So this is obviously now that the frothy white flowers have kind of been and gone, you're left with um, yeah, these green beautiful seed heads which again hang them out to dry and they'll look really really lovely and retain, retain their colour. So those are just a few examples of things that I found when I was out on my allotment um, and taking my boys for a walk earlier. But other things that you might have in your garden, um, we have, I have some nigella here, 
So most people, when they think of nigella and drying nigella, they think of um, the seed heads, when actually the flowers dry beautifully as well. So even when they're in bud, actually, um, and they look absolutely stunning in wreaths or just individually as displays. So I highly recommend those. Um, it can be quite... Uh, uncomfortable cutting flowers from your garden to dry. I certainly struggle with it a bit because I like to um, enjoy them whilst they're in the garden, but it's really worth doing it with nigella. Um, and then I also have here some oxide daisies, which again, they dry beautifully. Uh, they will shrink to sort of quite a small size, but they look lovely in a big vase on their own dry out. Um, and so those are just a few, few examples of things that might be in your garden at the moment um, awaiting <laughs> you to go out and discover them. But other things that are probably coming to fruition now are things like poppy seed heads. So we know that poppies obviously flower um, and turn to seed sometimes in the space of a day or two if the weather's really hot and then you're left with a beautiful seed head. So it's worth having a look for those. Uh, peonies, if you've still got any of those left, they can dry beautifully too. So an example of a peony dried is here. It's a bit breezy today actually. Um, and you just want to hang those ones upside down. Um, scabious is coming into flower. Scabious beautiful from a flower head perspective dried, but then also from a seed head perspective. And then herbs are wonderful, so sage. Um, spearmint, um, oregano, thyme, all those things, especially when they're in flower, dry absolutely beautiful, beautifully. And I'm sure, you know, if you have a garden, you'll probably have at least some of these things within your garden space. So when it comes to drying, um, a few tips that I just kind of wanted to share with you or recommendations of how you dry. Basically what you want to do if you're working with um, flowers to dry, I've got some peonies here which I can just uh, demonstrate up with. I actually don't know how these will dry because they're very pale. Um, they're actually shop bought. So I had to go to Tesco's the other day and they were um, reduced to a couple of pounds and I thought well I'll just give them a go and see. Um, so basically what you want to do if you are hanging your flowers out to dry is you want to remove all excess leaves. With peonies I tend to leave one or two on there. Um, they actually dry beautifully so kind of like that. And then you want to take some string, which I now can't find any. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Take some string, raffia, anything really, um, with which to tie your peony up and you just secure it at the base of the stem a couple of times. And then you want to hang that out. Now I have created a hanging station here in my studio, in part because I love to see how the fly flowers dry myself, but also because I live in quite a small house and I don't have anywhere else to dry them. But the things that you want to make sure um, you try to uh, take care of when you're positioning your flowers to dry is that your space is um, dry predominantly, so no moisture. A bathroom, for example, is not gonna work is not in too much direct sunlight for too much of the day. So a little bit is fine, but not too much. Ideally, you know, under the cupboard, a uh, cupboard under the stairs is brilliant, or um, an airing cupboard if it's not too hot, because the other thing is you don't want it to be too hot as well. So basically, as dark or out of direct sunlight as possible, not too hot, searingly hot, with no moisture. And then you can um, hang it however you want. With something big like a peony, I hang them individually. So I'll hang stem by stem, as you can see behind me. Um, for something like this fever few we were just discussing earlier, I would hang those in bunches like this. Um, and probably I wouldn't even take much of their little front fronds off the side, actually, because I think they're beautiful. Same with the cow parsley and the shepherd's purses pretty much dry as it is anyway, but same for that as well. I would hang in bunches, maybe of 10 to 12 stems, quite tightly because they do shrink and you need to make sure that your material, you know, holds them in place basically. Um, and that's probably the easiest way for which you're gonna dry. Um, another way, which is lovely to do if you've got kids at home, is uh, to use a flower press. Um, I have a couple because I, press flowers kind of endlessly um, but you could also use a book 
and you could just put some little slips of paper in between the pages if you didn't want the pages to get damaged. Um, but the idea is you just need something heavy on either side of the flowers and flat that will squash them and hold them in place to press them uh, for you to use later. And flowers that work really well for this, again, you might want to use a nigella. Um, peonies, uh, sorry, pansies, violas, um, cosmos, when they come out, should be in the next couple of weeks ago, I would imagine. Um, and anything really that is delicate um, and that you want to preserve the sort of flower head and form. So, um, yeah, again, a poppy actually is beautiful pressed as well and really, really easy to do. And those are my top tips really for, um, for drying flowers. I talk a lot more on my book. There's a couple of other methods that I touch upon. Um, that are really useful for their different purposes, but these are the main ones that I use to dry my flowers. I tend to dry them for two to three weeks um, before I'm able to work with them, although sometimes they'll stay hanging for longer, depending on what I have going on. Um, and then, yeah, I, I am still experimenting with what works, um, and I often get asked what dries and what doesn't dry, and my honest recommend recommendation to everyone who asks that question is just have a go because the worst that's going to happen is it doesn't work and you'll have to compost the flower that you've tried to dry but the best that could happen is you'll end up with something beautiful um, but a general rule of thumb when you're looking at material to dry is I, I kind of um, say avoid anything that is as juicy as a dandelion for example because that really is probably not going to dry very well look more for blooms that have that slightly woodier stem, even if the flower themselves is quite kind of luscious, the woody stem normally means that they will dry quite well. Again, nigella is a good example of that. It's really, you know, kind of um, a juicy flower at the top, but you can feel the stem is quite woody. So as a rule of thumb, knowing that actually nature is wonderful and unique, um, that's kind of what I stick to. Uh, so what I will do now is I'm just going to take you for a little tour around my very small garden to show you the possibilities um, that there are within a space of a garden my size and the kind of things that I'm growing to dry. Um, and then I will wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you so much for listening. And if you've got any questions, I think there's an opportunity afterwards to join me on Zoom and have a chat about drying flowers and anything else that you may have on the subject. Okay, so I live in the centre of a really busy town and we have a perfectly sized garden for our needs. Um, right now I have two small boys, so I have to manage that as well as uh, growing and creating. Um, and I tend to garden with biodiversity mainly in mind, um, but also as much as possible thinking about the kinds of materials that I could use to dry with afterwards. Um, so if we take a stroll through my back border, which is still in process, I'm moving to actually more of a perennial prairie style um, to make sure that I have year-round interest. So I'm really interested in plants that have seed heads throughout you know, the autumn and winter. So I have lots of poppies coming up, um, purple loose drive here, which will dry beautifully, um, and then obviously go to seed and provide it with the seed heads. I have Blepleurum here, which I can dry, and I'll be picking some of that actually really, really soon to dry with. Um, and if I move on here, we have some more Nigella, cornflowers, and these white flowers at the back are winged Amobium, and they are stunning dried, really, really, really beautiful. Um, this here is a type of um, something from the mint family. The bees absolutely love it and then it also dries beautifully as well. And what's great about that is I can cut it regularly and it comes back and flowers maybe two or three times in a season, which is brilliant. I have some scabious down here, again, which I will press. I'll hang out to dry. Um, I will wait for their seed heads to form and then use those as well. And then all around, in the space that I have, I'm growing pansies and violas, which then go in the flower press. And with those I'll make, um, with the press flowers, I'll make thank you cards or press flower art or something like that, or just marvel at their beauty, <laughs> to be honest. Um, 
yeah and that's kind of the sum of my garden really we have a few other spaces where we grow but this is the main bulk of it and I have a very 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 full greenhouse bursting with fruit and veg waiting to be sown